All right, hello. Um, today I'm going to be talking about culture um, and occupational therapy, um, why it's so important, um, all the different dimensions of culture, um, and I'm going to try and limit some of my personal examples with culture. Um, it just this I just ramble on too long. Um, this is like the third recording I've done and I'm trying to stick with my time here a little bit better for you. So um, let's see here. So our learning objectives, um, I <clears throat> want you to be able to explore your own cultural identities and just build awareness on on your own personal cultures. Um, identify potential biases that you may have um, and then develop a plan for increasing um, your comfort level, your competence, your proficient proficiency when working with those those cultures. Um, with our assignment, I simply want you to be able to attain some cultural knowledge about a culture other than your own. Um, and then I want you to identify strategies for eliciting cultural information from clients. Um, I kind of hinted about some of that in my model um, example about how culture is just not um, necessarily black and white. Um, you can't exactly say, hey, client, what's your culture? And they're going to respond, um, you know, I am Hindu, you know, for a culture. Um, and so um, when trying to decide what to put in our curriculum um, and where to put culture, um, we thought this would be an appropriate place, um, particularly because usually um, a lot of our students go out onto Peru um, and then they come back and they talk about culture um, and then our students on on a traditional face-to-face -face, um, field work will come back and they'll talk about culture too um, and so it, it lends itself to a very nice discussion um, because you're actually seeing a wide variety of people um, because your fieldwork case was just a little bit different this year, um, we decided to put culture here um, after you did fieldwork, primarily because Aiden, um, I, I think Samu case purposely did not put a lot of um, personal information in there. Um, that way students could focus primarily on the evaluation, the evaluation results. Um, and it really warmed my heart hearing so many of you say, but knowing his culture, knowing his background, knowing his home life, and having more of that history would certainly have impacted his plan. And so yes, yes it would have. And now we're going to use our imaginations for Aiden and decide um, what if, okay, we're going to play the what if game. What if Aiden was a member of a different cultural group? Okay, how would that impact your evaluation? How would that change your intervention plan? So um, that's what I'm looking for in our in our assignments and we'll in our discussion and such we'll be talking about and problem solving some of those ideas as well. Um, so I did post some readings. Um, these readings came from a really wonderful book you guys called Culture and Occupation. Um, I know it's probably backwards here for you, um, but this is a book many of the faculty who have got their clinical doctorates had to get. It was required reading for them. Um, I just have always had a fascination with culture, and so um, if anybody wants any cultural books, <laughs> these are just a few just a few that I have about culture and health and illness, working across cultures, cultural rehab, um, and cultural competence towards cultural um, proficiency. So um, nonetheless, it's been um, really um, an area of passion of mine. And so what is culture? Culture is typically an umbrella term. Okay, so it's not a singular term. It's not like what culture are you? It is or my culture is, right? It's an umbrella term that just covers social behavior, maybe a, a, a norm, um, a normal behavior, um, a way to act that's found in that society or that social group. Okay, it includes knowledge, beliefs, arts, laws, um, customs, capabilities, habits um, within these social groups. Um, what's interesting, I think, is it's dynamic, um, it's evolved, or it evolves 
and it's learned. And so it can come from different perspectives. Um, it can change over time, and we'll talk a little bit about about some of that here in the future. So his and, and what I'm going to talk about is different theoretical dimensions of culture, and I and I'm choosing to do that for you guys because I, I think if we look at the different um, dimensions of it, such as perspectives, such as influences, we'll kind of understand why uh, culture is so hard to maybe pinpoint and why we see it um, popping up in different areas in OT. Um, so historical, just something that's being passed from generation to generation, um, one thing to the next. Okay, behavioral is something that's learned, um, an accepted way to conduct yourself. Um, we've all probably gone where our parents have said, hey, um, you know, you don't act like that here, right? And so you have to learn how to conduct yourself. Um, symbolic, um, something that's a shared subjective meaning of a particular group. Um, I think of, you know, being part of a, a private Catholic Benedictine Christian University, I think of crucifixes and how they have a shared meaning um, to our work group. Um, structural, um, so patterns, maybe interrelated ideas, um, maybe symbols, behaviors, anything that structures um, that particular social group. And so I think of um, maybe families, um, as a social group, um, large families, and what are the roles? What are the patterns? What are the behaviors that occur within that family? So is there the provider? Is there the caretaker? Are they both providers? Do they share the same um, child rearing abilities? Um, and so that would be a thing, an example that would structure um, that social group of that family. Um, normative is any prescribed ideas, values, and rules of the group. These are these general rules of the road that we all follow, right? Wearing your hair a certain way or fixing your hair for that matter. Um, wearing certain types of clothes, what's in style, um, those kinds of things. Now, um, we can observe culture from, as something that's external. Um, or we can observe culture from something that's internal. So with external, it's visible, um, anything observable. Um, so it can be maybe types of clothing, maybe traditional clothing that they wear. Um, maybe it's the burqa, right? Maybe it is a particular type of food um, or something like something that we can observe. Um, culture is internal is more of how we respond internally to a given situation. OK, and so um, maybe because I am, a, you know, raised German and I'm a, I'm a male, um, I've been told that I'm not supposed to cry. OK, and so during a funeral, those kinds of things in that given situation, um, it may be very uncomfortable for me. I may feel like um, I may feel uncomfortable to cry because I've been taught internally that I'm not supposed to react that way. OK. So just take a few minutes and think about your own culture um, and the different perspectives of these culture or this culture. Has anything been passed down from your grandparents to your parents to you um, as far as behavior goes? OK, or um, as far as uh, thoughts, beliefs. Um, so who taught that with you? Who shared it with you? OK, um, behavioral. What is an event you went to and you had to behave a certain way? How did you find out how to behave? Um, and do you ever remember making a mistake? I've made lots of mistakes when I've gone to Peru. Um, symbolic. What is a symbol of a societal group you belong to and what does it mean? OK, um, so do you have any symbols um, within a particular social group that you belong with? And, and again, what what does it symbolize? Um, structural, how was your family run? Is someone in charge of certain things? And normative, what are some of the prescribed values in your social group you belong with? Um, were there any you questioned, but simply felt like you had to go along with the group because that was the rules of the road? Okay, so take a few minutes, um, pause this if you will, and try and, try and think about um, 
some of these influences that may have impacted your personal culture. So I've talked about culture group and that's just any group that share belief central to a core identity. OK, so you may share a same symbol such as a flag, um, maybe a certain gesture, traditional clothing, um, yeah, crucifixes, um, anything symbolic like that. OK, and so many times people subscribe to more than one cultural group, right? So um, I'm a member of the University of Mary cultural group. It's a social group. There's people there. We socialize and we all have the same general beliefs, right? We're all working towards the same mission, the same values. We have the Benedictine values um, that we believe in. Um, we believe in our community. Um, community comes first. Um, and so we all share those general beliefs. OK, well, when I go home, I have my own family social group, right? Where we're all um, we all have different roles. We all have different responsibilities. Um, we all um, share the same belief of hard work. Um, we share the belief of Christianity. We share the belief um, of caring for others um, and learning and those kinds of things. And so um, we all have those same general beliefs. And so you can subscribe to more than one cultural group. And I, I suspect that many of you um, are part of many different cultural groups, perhaps with different rules, different um, different beliefs, um, those kinds of things. And so I think, again, that's another reason why culture is hard to pinpoint. Um, when you say, hey, what's your culture? You have to think, what is your culture based on your cultural group? And we're all involved in many, many cultural groups. Um, socialization is a very interesting concept um, when talking about culture. Um, socialization is where a cultural group who has the same network of beliefs, values, and attitudes um, actually morph over time or they change over time. OK, and so maybe some some social group who's a little more conservative at first um, believed in um, Goodness, I'm trying to think of an example off the top of my head. Um, you know, I, well, let's let's just talk about um, television for that matter, okay? And the shared beliefs of society at the time of like I Love Lucy and and some of those shows, which hopefully you guys have at least heard of. Um, but initially, they had you know man and wife, and they slept in separate beds. Right, because the view, the value, the view of, of sexuality was to not have that shared on television. And so they separated the man and the wife. And so over time, clearly um, that belief, that value has changed over time. Now, you know, you turn on the TV and it's it's um, how do you say rather um, difficult to watch around young kids. <laughs> so um, people are born into a culture. However, um, beliefs may be influenced by personal experience and exposure to other cultures. OK, and I, I just really hold true um, to this. Um, you know, I was born in a traditional, maybe German, Norwegian type of culture. Um, however, you know, over time, like there were things my my parents didn't choose to pass down to me because there were things they didn't like. Um, some of the foods they didn't like, um, like um, lutefisk. My mom hated lutefisk because her dad, who was mostly Norwegian, loved lutefisk. And she said it stunk up the whole house so bad and we just never had it. It was just awful. Um, and, you know, yada, yada, yada. And so I have never tried lutefisk and and again being Norwegian and German is is you know a big well it's not a big part of my life but it's it's part of who um, part of my roots I should say um, and so I had never been exposed to that okay um, I've certainly been exposed to um, Native American culture as my children are Native American. Um, I've been exposed to um, Peruvian culture um, and and so all of those different cultures have impacted my life with simple things like decor, simple things like um, 
communication, um, simple things like foods and traditional foods that I that I make. Um, so it's it's again, my culture today is so much different than the culture, um, you know, 10, 10 years ago before I experienced some of these other cultures. Um, so culture is a process. Um, again, it's something you learn. It can be localized to your local community. Um, you can base patterns of behavior um, based on your values. Um, they can be adapted. Um, and so culture then becomes this morphed idea, this, this pattern of living, this way of life, these individual beliefs, right, that can shift and be unique to every single individual. Okay, so it doesn't matter if you're Native American. If you're Native American, you may subscribe to um, this belief or that belief that's traditional, but you maybe have socialized, right, over time and maybe have let some of those traditional things go. So it's, it's important not to stereotype cultural groups. Um, that way you can, um, but that you have to learn um, from them and, and apply all these different concepts of culture. Um, this is a continuum of cultural domains. And so depending on what culture you're looking at, they may not occupy one extreme or the other. So you can see these different terms as one extreme, and then on the other side, there's the other extreme, okay? And so your sense of power. Um, some cultures on one extreme, you know, there is um, a king, right? There is a ruler. We all follow the ruler. Right. Um, on the other sense, on the other side of the continuum is maybe that shared governance. And so um, we all come together, we all meet together and we decide as a group. OK, I think of maybe today's government, right, with we have the president, we have Congress, OK, they're leaders, they have power. Um, I think of more of the Native American culture, which is a sovereign nation. Um, and a lot of times their tribal council meets and they set up rules um, and guidelines together based on a group. OK, so again, not, you know, they may not be on one extreme or the other, um, but I think they're different examples of, of cultural groups and their beliefs of power. Um, sense of self. And so on one extreme, extreme, our sense of self can be about oneself first, putting oneself above all rest. Um, and the other side is more about what is good for the community. Okay. Um, human and nature relationship. On one end, we have people who just don't care about nature. We're going to bulldoze it down for the good of humankind. On the other side of the spectrum, we have no humans live in harmony with with nature. Um, we work together. We don't want to leave a big impact um, on nature. Um, human activity. On one side of, of human activity, we have um, we are going to engage in an activity. And then when we're engaging in that activity, when we come across other people, we'll work together with that activity. OK, so I'm thinking of if I like to go running, right? And I go to the gym and I go running on a trail or whatever. Um, and there's other people that happen to be there running and we're like, let's run together, right? And so the focus is more on the activity itself and not necessarily on the human interaction. On the opposite end of the spectrum or on the continuum, we have um, humans are already together in a social group. And we say, hey, since we're together as a social group, what do we want to do together? What should we go do and hang out with? OK, and so based on the group, then you decide what activity you focus on. OK, so on one side, the focus is on the activity. On the other side, the focus is more so on the people um, and the group guiding the activity. Communication style. Um, on one end of the spectrum or on one end of the continuum, we have a very direct um, to the point type of communication style. And on the other end, um, we have more of an indirect type of communication style where it takes just a little bit longer, a little bit more to get to the point. OK, in Peru, um, I feel like they have a more indirect type of communication style than what we do in the United States. Um, they'll 
I'll, I'll get the sense that they want me to do something like they'll want me to present on a topic and they'll they won't just come out and ask they'll like kind of beat around the bush um how do you know anything about like um ergonomico and i'm like hmm what's that ergonomics yeah yeah i know something about that oh that good that good um yeah that is good you know and then they'll just kind of look at me and then they'll go away for a little bit then they'll come back and so what do you know about um ergonomics and well like what do you mean what kind of ergonomics and so then eventually at the end of the day <laughs> they'll say um, well, I'll I'll figure out like, would you like me to do something like a presentation on ergonomics? Oh, if you if you think um, if you think you could, you know, so they want to be so respectful and and really um, my style is just tell me what you want, right? I want you to be happy. I want to help you. And so if you feel like a presentation on ergonomics is going to help you, just tell me that I'll do it. <laughs> and so they don't necessarily communicate that way. Um, morality is more so related to, um, you know, your sense of, of um, on one side of the spectrum or, or continuum, it's um, what's right. Um, I feel it's right to do this um, versus uh, more of an obligation. Like I'm, I'm, I need to do this. I have to do this. I'm told I have to do this. Okay. And so one is sort of led by right and wrong. And one on the other side is led by, um, somebody's duty, um, behavioral flexibility. So on one side of the spectrum, we have, um, maybe people who are a little bit more, um, flexible with their behaviors, meaning they're a little bit more, um, they can tolerate risky behaviors a little bit more. And then on the other side, we have more of that conservative um, behavior where they they you know follow the rules, they do this and then this. And so they're they have much more structure um, to how they act. Um, preferred gender traits. <clears throat> and so this doesn't necessarily mean um, you know man on one side, woman on the other side, but it's more of those masculinity, femininity traits. So on one side of the spectrum, we have more of the masculine femin or masculine traits, which is um, I need to get ahead. I need to I need to make rules. Um, I need to do um, I need to. Um, oh, I'm looking at my notes here, there was. I. <clears throat> I need to rise above everybody else and make decisions on behalf of everybody else. OK, where on the other side of the spectrum is more of that femininity, um, where it is um, more about caring for other people. It's more about cooperating with other people. It's more about um, let's work as a group to accomplish something. So nobody's particularly rising above the rest. OK, and so again, it's not necessarily like all all women subscribe to the femininity side of of the culture. Um, yeah, I certainly know some females who are more on the masculinity side when it comes to some of their some of their preferred traits. But um, but nonetheless, I mean, you can start certainly see some cultures subscribing to one side versus the other. Um, sense of time is also another domain of culture. Um, in America, we have, you know, set times. We start class at nine. Being on time is very important, blah, 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 right? Then we do 10, and then we have 11, and then we have four, and then we eat dinner at five, and then we go to bed at seven. Um, and so we follow that set routine, and we really reliant on, on time, right? Um, <clears throat> so I'm just looking at my time now. So um, your sense of time, again, in other cultures, um, may be more fluid. It may be more cyclical. And so um, instead of following like 9 o'clock, 10 o'clock, it's more like, oh, I think it's about that time. I think it's about that time to have dinner. Let's start making dinner, you know, or I, it's about that time to plant the garden. I think the weather's warm. And so it's more of that um, season of time, if you will, or cycle of time, um, as opposed to a direct time. So
so um, here's yet another um, area of influence or something that can influence culture. And so we have our individual culture, right? Our individual beliefs, our, our patterns of behavior, uh, maybe our roles that we play um, that all guide who we are as a person or identity. Um, and then our close knit family, our close knit friends, maybe the social groups that are that are close to us um, that we're really involved in are going to to affect our culture as an individual too. Right. So if your family is Christian um, and they you grew up going to church every Sunday and you grew up celebrating um, some of the Christian holidays and you had certain traditions, OK, that may affect you as an individual in doing some of those same types of traditions and following some of those same beliefs. If you're hanging out with some of your friends in college and they are study bugs and they want to study with you all the time um, and that's part of the, the culture of being a student and the expectation of being a student, right, um, that could infiltrate you, to you um, and maybe help increase that value. Um, same with some of those same um, tight knit social groups that you're involved in, right? They may have some type of belief. Maybe it's a student organization you're involved in, um, something along those lines. And so you may subscribe um, to some of those um, general beliefs. Um, some of you may belong to an organization, and so it may be a personal organization, a professional organization like AOTA. Um, it may be an organization like the Elks Club in the community or something along those lines. So again, all of those organizations have perhaps um, different values, different belief systems, and again, that can influence us as an individual. Um, and what what culture we we subscribe to, what values, what rules we we abide by. Um, structural can also influence our culture, and so this is um, more about laws, maybe regulations in place, um, policies, um, just our overall society, our overall community, our state community, um, all of those laws and such guide um, how we behave um, in a given in a given culture. OK, so it's structural, organizational, interpersonal, um, all of those different items can influence us in our own culture. So where do we see culture come up in our curriculum? OK, we see culture pop up in our curriculum, certainly in models of practice. OK, and in models of practice, we see sometimes culture coming up in more so the environment, right? But we do have some culture um, that sort of, uh, I think they call it context in, in some of the some of the models also and with context then as part of the person context it, you see culture pop up there and so in the models of practice sometimes it's very subtle um, and on where it's at in our ot practice framework we only see culture we see culture pop up in context and environment so very similar to models of practice but let's take into account and let's not lose sight that culture is that umbrella term, right? That gives us um, our patterns of behavior that influences our values and our beliefs. And so when we understand the definition of culture and we look then at the OT practice framework and we're seeing client factors as values and beliefs of our client, well, that's part of culture, right? Performance patterns, habits, routines, roles, rituals. Well, those are all dependent upon culture. And so culture, I would argue, lives in client factors. It lives in performance patterns, and it also lives in environments. And so culture, I think, can be, can be a part of all of those different areas of the OT practice framework. Um, culture and in exposing students to different cultures um, is an accreditation standard. So applying um, what you learn across cultures, um, being able to interpret standardized assessment um, given different cultures. Um, and so you see these pop up in accreditation standards um, as means that students need to um, 
need to meet um, in order for accreditation. And, and perhaps you can think of others. Okay, so why is so why is culture so important in OT? So the diversity of the United States continues to grow. Um, and this is just fascinating to me. So like when my great grandparents came to this country, um, they did cho and they had children. They chose not to teach their children their language. They said, no, nope, we're American now. Um, so we need to assimilate. We need to be part of this other culture. So they left behind a lot of their culture. OK, um, maybe they were farmers, right? And then they moved to the United States and they wanted to farm, but they had to find land and that took a while and, you know, blah, blah, blah. And so um, the United States, I think that was very common at that time and was called a melting pot because all these different cultures were coming from different areas and sort of melting and becoming one um, in, in our society. Um, and so much is lost. Like I've recently um, lost my grandmother. Um, and, you know, there's so many questions I wanted to ask her about, you know, her parents and, and her grandparents and what it was like for them to come over. And, you know, those are things that they never talked about. There was just, no, that was not, that's not, we don't talk about that anymore. And so I feel like that part um, of my heritage or culture um, is hard to pinpoint because of that. Now we have, um, and that's called acculturation, okay? Um, once a melting pot for acculturation where, where culture is taken away and a new culture sort of emerges or we're blending in to a new culture or the culture around us, um, now it's the U.S. is known to be a salad bowl. So we have a chunk of lettuce in here, right, who's lettuce and they practice being lettuce. And then we have a chunk of tomato who's a tomato and it's embedded with the lettuce, but they're still being a tomato, right? And then we have croutons and they're croutons and they have the beliefs of the croutons that they need to be crunchy and maybe seasoned, right? And so they're different cultures um, living together um within a salad now if you leave a salad in the fridge the croutons are going to get soggy right they're going to take on some of the culture of the lettuce or some of the culture of the tomato and then you're going to end up with some kind of a hybrid culture where they've taken on certain aspects of the cultures around them they're still practicing their traditional cultures but they're like hey you know what i kind of like america this way i'm going to do this um, and so that results in a sort of hybrid culture. So the daycare person that I take my children to is Buddhist um, and she's Korean. Um, and yet, since she's non-Christian, um, she still celebrates Christmas um, because she likes the idea of it. And so um, she's a Buddhist woman um, who celebrates Christmas, okay? So again, that's kind of that hybrid culture. Um, where cultural pluralism is maybe a, a culture or is is popular, right? And so, um, gosh, I just love Italian food. I love Italian food. And so if I were to go to a big city, I like to go to like Italian sections of the town, like Little Italy, and I like to go through and I like to find an Italian restaurant, like a, a, a um, authentic Italian restaurant. And so, um, I'm seeking out that culture because I really like it. I'm not Italian by nature, um, but when I come home then, I'm like, oh, that was such good food. I'm going to try and make Italian food at home. And so that piece of that Italian culture is plural, right? It's more than one. I'm, I'm going there to seek it out, and I'm bringing some back with me um, as a white American. Okay, and so that's more of that cultural pluralism. And so we're seeing some of that too. And it's so important as OTs because again, um, client factors, what are my values and my beliefs? Performance patterns, okay? I tend to be the cook in the family. What kinds of things do I cook? Well, I like to cook Italian food. I like, I just made chicken Parmesan the other day, right? And I made tiramisu and I um, had wine and, you know, blah, blah, blah. And so um, knowing 
that about me as a person. If you were just to look at me, a white male, maybe you could assume that I never cook in my life or um, I've certainly known some white men who never have cooked in their life and that's that's fine. Right. That's completely fine. But that's not me. And so in OT being client centered, you have to find out who your client is and what they value, what they believe, how that affects their roles, their rituals, their habits, their routines. Right. And so um, it become culture becomes very personal and very unique to each individual. Okay, because again, it can evolve over time and it can be, it can occur because of what we're exposed to and just little things that we cherry pick and apply and choose to apply in our daily life. Um, client centered care. Um, again, the client comes first. We identify what's important for the client and then we choose our assessment, our evaluation from there um, if we're able to, right? Um, and so, Cultural competence, again, we should strive for cultural competence. And I'm, I'm going to talk a little bit more about cultural competence as a term, I believe, on the next slide. Um, so cultural competence is defined as the process of actively developing and practicing appropriate, relevant, and sensitive strategies and skills when you interact with culturally different persons. OK, so in order to be culturally competent, you have to actively, you have to do something. You have to actively develop your skill. You have to seek out and practice your skill, okay? Um, when interacting with, with people of different cultures. So you see a lot of the different terms used perhaps in articles, perhaps um, in, in culture books, you'll see culturally responsive or you one must have cultural humility. One must have, be culturally intelligent. One must um, exercise cultural safety. One must be culturally congru or cultural, cultural congruence, culturally proficient, culturally effectiveness. OK, and so <clears throat> um, some of these terms are in your readings and, and for the sake of time, I'm not going to go through each and every one. But this is a really neat checklist to see that in order to have every characteristic of approach with intercultural interactions, so being culturally responsive all the way down to cultural effectiveness, you have to have self-awareness. You have to be aware of your own culture. You have to be aware of what that difference is between your culture and the other culture. Well, if you our next step, then once we develop that self-awareness is you have to have general knowledge and working knowledge about that other culture, right? If you don't have that knowledge about the other culture, then you're not going to know what those differences are, right? Um, you won't even know that it's part of that person's culture. So I think we all know that we need to respect um, an individual's culture, but sometimes we don't always understand or know or recognize that it is something cultural. Um, and so it's a nice little checklist here to see, OK, what do you need um, for all of these things? And when we go down to um, cultural effectiveness, this is where we're being effective with our treatment, with our intervention plans um, in in working with people of other cultures. We have to be aware. We have to have that knowledge. We have to build or we have to have some skills when working with other cultures. Um, we have to be open um, with a will attitude. Um, we have to have some of those experiences with other cultures. We have to be able to critically reflect um, on interacting with other cultures and we have to give consideration of all contexts of culture um, and not just maybe ethnicity or, or something like that. And so this is a really neat slide. Um, so be sure you're reviewing um, your readings to get a little more um, clarity if you need it. So achieving cultural competence um, and proficiency. And so this is a continuum. Um, and this is a very, very, very interesting, um, interesting um, continuum. Um, it's 
following steps, if you will, towards working towards cultural competence and cultural proficiency. And when I read it, I it be, it made me a, I, I <laughs> it's it's making me uncomfortable even talking about it. Um, it made me very sad, and you know with with today's society and with the media with with the black lives matter movement um that really um impacted me um in preparing this lecture um because when i first prepared it and when i read it i'm like oh i don't even think i want to cover cultural destructiveness and cultural incapacity with our students because I just don't think that exists um, in this day. And certainly, you know, our students aren't um, in any of those particular levels. And so um, I went back and forth between using this or showing this and then using a, a model by Cross et al. about um, steps for cultural competence, which I use for my dissertation. And I thought, you know what, um, in light of society, in light of everything that's going on um, politically, I think I'm going to leave it in here because I think we can all now at least maybe um, see um, some of these things at play in today's society. So cultural destructiveness. This is where we're purposely destructing a culture, okay, where we're um, just do not value the other culture and we're trying to bring them down, okay. Um, cultural incapacity is blaming or devaluing a culture. So when I initially was reading this, I, I thought of, you know, a couple years or a few years ago, I can't remember if it was two or three years ago, um, I had the opportunity to go to Europe um, as part of a faculty retreat and we um, toured um, Dachau, um, the concentration camp, um, and we went to um, the place where they had the Nuremberg trials um, with Nazi Germany. Um, and so I'm thinking of not, I thought of Nazi, um, you know, the, the Nazi era um, where they purposely destructed um, the Nazi or they purposely destructed the, the Jewish culture, okay, and, and some other cultures um, in the way. Um, cultural incapacity is blaming or devaluing a culture. And so blaming, you know, their economy on um, the Jewish culture. Um, and devaluing them, right? Spitting on them when they'd walk by, um, you know, beating them up, um, all those kinds of things. And so, again, I, I hope <laughs> these these things make me, you know, just sick to my stomach um, with with worry. Um, the third one is cultural blindness, and this is where we fail to acknowledge differences about cultures. And now this one. I, I can kind of see, I can, um, because when I was growing up in my generation, um, I lived close to a, an Indian reservation and um, we had students who would kind of go back and forth from living on the reservation and going to a reservation school and then coming to our school. Um, and I remember as a young kid thinking like, wow, and we call that Indi they, we call them Indians back then and and um, wow, they're so cool, right? And I remember asking um, this this girl questions about, um, wow, is your brother a chief? And you know, she's like, yeah, and she'd show me a picture and his like trad traditional um, regalia is what it's called. And wow, that's so cool. And then the teacher would come over and say, don't talk about that. You're all the same color. Color doesn't matter. Skin color doesn't matter. We're not supposed to see skin color, right? And so then eventually, um, you know, she stopped talking about her culture. And, you know, by golly, it wasn't until um, like 20 years later um, when I actually asked her, because we still keep it, I still keep in contact with her to this day, um, and I, I asked her, you know what, Lana, I grew up with you. You were a dear, you're a dear friend of mine. And never once did you tell me what tribe you belong to. And I just thought that was so sad. Like never once did, did we ever, were we ever able to have that conversation, nor were we ever able to talk about 
her experience with powwows um, or any of those things. And so um, at that time, I think it really, and, and now what I know in my life now about the Native American culture, but I feel like I was asked to be blind and to turn a blind eye um, at even identifying differences. And I think the heart was good. Right. I think the intention was good. Like, no, we don't want to we don't want to make fun of anybody because of the color of their skin. So we're all the same. But sometimes when we say that we're the same as somebody else and we don't acknowledge those differences, then we can't learn um, about those differences. Right. Um, <clears throat> cultural precompetence. This is just where we're beginning awareness that there are cultural differences and that we don't have information. OK, and so again, 20 years ago, um, I'm like, oh my goodness, um, I, I never knew um, how much your culture meant to you. And I didn't know the specifics about your culture um, and the cultural group you belonged to. I would like to know more information about that. Uh, and so again, you're just sort of beginning awareness that there are differences and that you don't have enough information. Um, then when you move to cultural competence, this is where you accept and respect differences. So yeah, you know what? We have differences. In my free time, um, I did, you know, gardening. I watched TV. I read books. I spent time at our local swimming pool. Um, those kinds of things, right? And in your free time, you learned how to do traditional Native American dancing. You were doing traditional beadwork um, for artwork. Um, you were making... Um, traditional fry bread and, and wojapi um, for food. And so like we have we have differences there, right? Um, and that's OK and that's really cool. Um, so I'm respecting that those differences existed and I am trying to improve my knowledge and I'm trying to improve my awareness and my effectiveness. And just think now if I um, had my friend Lana in in an OT um, type of setting in an OT clinic, right? And I didn't know that her patterns of behavior um, and her motivation and part of her culture was doing traditional um, jingle dancing, right? And I didn't know that her foods that she likes to cook um, are traditional fry bread um, with yeast and letting it rise and frying it in oil. And so if I have her in more of a traditional um, type of acute care setting, right, or transitional care setting, and I'm like, what do you need to do in order to go home? Well, you need to cook a meal, right? And so I'm like, well, let's go make a peanut butter and jelly sandwich, right? And she's like, great. But I don't eat peanut butter and jelly sandwich. I, I eat fry bread with wojapi and um, I haven't been able to have that for the three weeks that I've been hospitalized. So, so I mean, I could include that in my intervention for her to increase motivation and to actually truly assess, can she do this safely here? And if she can, that would give me an indication that she could safely do that at home um, for our discharge recommendation, right? So that would be an example of being and practicing cultural competence. Now, being culturally proficient means that I have a, st and a high esteem for all culture, that I'm promoting competence in others, right? So if I see a fellow OT that's, that's taking her in there um, into the kitchen and frying um, eggs, and she's like, yeah, um, we don't, she literally lives in a food desert type of area where they don't have access to fresh, fresh eggs. So like, and she doesn't raise chickens. Um, so how meaningful is it for her to, to make eggs, right? And so um, I would say, hey, you know what? I don't think that is a traditional food or a food that she likes. I think if you find a little bit more about her culture, her patterns of living, her behaviors, her roles, um, I think you're going to understand maybe something a little bit more um, effective for your intervention. Okay, and so then you create this lifelong learning um, where 
you know, you'll you'll never be culturally um, proficient. Um, it's an evolving thing that you have to do. Um, again, think every single client you have, no matter if they're black, if they're white, if they're brown, um, no matter what ethnicity they are, you're going to see some concepts of their culture maybe ring true um, to the color of their skin and their ethnicity. But again, culture evolves over time. And maybe some things haven't been passed down from generation to generation. And maybe there's another component or another influence of their culture that you need to take into account. So every client's culture is going to be different and you need to just learn about every single client's culture so that you're not um, making mistakes and that you're not um, doing something that is not culturally appropriate. So the first thing we need to do um, to help ourselves be better at cultural competence and, and being culturally effective is build our own self-awareness. Okay, so recognize that a person has is unique, that they all have specific cultural backgrounds um, that are going to influence their beliefs, values, attitudes, and behaviors. Um, and so in order to understand or appreciate that somebody is of a different culture than you, you have to be able to understand your own culture first. So who are you as a person? Where do your values, where do your beliefs come from? Okay, and then, okay, I'm working with somebody now who doesn't have those same values and those same beliefs. So then, you know, you'll start to identify similarities and differences within these other cultures. Um, and not so that you can say, I don't have the same belief as you, you know, shame on you, you don't deserve treatment. I can't ever work with you because you don't have the same values as me. No, our whole point of being culturally aware is so that we can rise above that. Um, so that we can say, okay, there's a difference here, um, but my client's important. Um, I'm a client-centered practitioner. And so I need to kind of go along with them, even though I may have a different um, set of beliefs. Um, we're the same and identifying similarities means, okay, we're the same in these areas. So <clears throat> even if you have a difference, can okay, you see a difference in another culture and you're having a hard time with that? If you focus on what you have the same, um, maybe a belief, um, maybe living in the same area, maybe a shared experience of something, um, you start to see that person more compassionately um, <clears throat> and more as a person and you can treat them um, with the respect that they deserve. Okay, and so again, not only just acknowledging, okay, we have differences in beliefs here, um, but here are our similarities. Um, and so I can still um, work with this person and, and use this um, to our benefit. Now, in order to do that, you also need self-reflection. And so this is where you should develop a deep level of reflection about your own culture. Identify biases. Maybe there's cultural groups out there that you would have a hard time working with. I remember a student um, telling me at one point, <clears throat> you know, gosh, I, there is no way I could work with a client from this particular cultural group. There is no way. Um, I, they just, their beliefs are so different than me and I don't understand them and I don't understand why they would ever do that and I just could never work with them. And so five years later, and that broke my heart. That broke my heart because there's times in my practice where um, treating somebody was, was rather difficult, okay? To be perfectly honest with you and hoping I'm not offending any of you, um, but I remember um, having people come in as an outpatient um, in handcuffs, right, and having to treat um, a hand injury um, because they, you know, stabbed somebody in prison while they were incarcerated and they needed to come to outpatient therapy to do um, some wound care, right, and I'm like, oh my gosh, you know, you're a violent person, I'm scared, 
right? So I felt un I felt uncomfortable about that, and so I had to kind of set that aside um, and ask them, like, "Hey, tell me about your life. What's it like?" You know, um, as they're wearing all orange, and then I'm kind of like putting my foot in my mouth, like, "Oh crap, should have I asked that because you're incarcerated, right?" But you know, they did answer it and they said, yeah, so, you know, I get up in the morning and I do this and I do that and blah, blah, blah. And I'm still able to do this and I'm, I'm able to work out, but I don't, I, I can't work out. And that's really my, what keeps me sane. And so as they're sharing their story, I'm, I'm starting to develop a sense of compassion for them. Right. And I'm, I'm starting then to see, okay, well, we can work on that. Like, let's get you doing the things you want to do. And I can oversee the fact that maybe and work through um, my discomfort. And so um, five years after I had that student in class, I saw her in practice and she was working with somebody of that same particular cultural group and she was talking to them in the waiting room and I thought, good for you. I was so, so proud of her um, that she was, she had dealt with her bias um, and she was providing care and it looked like she was providing really good client-centered care um, at that time. So I was really proud of her. Um, another example, um, and, and one that I, I come across, I think, a lot working in foster care is stealing, you know, is it right or wrong? And so my values, my beliefs is that it's wrong. You know, I was raised that it's wrong. If you do it, you go to jail. It's bad, right? Um, and so working in foster care, I've, I've worked with some youth who um, have gone many meals uh, or who have not had many meals. They've gone several days in a row without anything to eat from a very young age um, up until about age four, age five. And so um, when they had an opportunity to see food, um, they would they would steal it. They would take it. Um, they would sneak. They would sneak it. Um, so is that right or is that wrong? You know, that's that that's their pattern of behavior um, that's been influenced because of a low socioeconomic status. And again, looking at their family connection of their family not feeding them, in this case, because of substances and substance abuse. And so, you know, if I'm working with somebody who on paper, it says that they steal and I might feel uncomfortable about that and say, oh, that's so wrong. And oh my goodness, they're only seven years old and they're stealing. Like, oh, what a naughty kid, right? But as I get to know them, as I get to know their story, as I get to know their cultural influences, um, then I can kind of start seeing and understanding, oh, if I were in their shoes, I can't say I wouldn't do the same thing. Right, and that was a basis of survival and not necessarily purposely breaking rules. So that leads us then to this enlightened consciousness. Okay, so steps for self-reflection, checking one's own reactions when you're communicating with somebody of a diverse population. Like, do you get butterflies in your stomach? Do you get dry mouth? Do you start to shake? Um, <clears throat> becoming aware of one's impact to others. Um, this is fascinating, um, and, I, and I think for me, um, my mother and my sister uh, were always really good about sharing with me um, their reactions to um, men who were bigger than them. Um, and they said, Jason, you have to be aware, like as I was growing up, Jason, as you're growing up and you're getting bigger, you have to be aware that some some girls, some men might be in, or some girls might be intimidated by some men. Um, and I thought, well, that's silly. Like it's me. Like I don't have a, a you know harmful bone in my body, really. I mean, sometimes I get frustrated and I might you know yell here or there, but I mean, goodness sakes. Um, and a few years ago, I was walking um, in downtown Nashville, I believe it was. Um, I wanted to go see a park um, and I ended up getting lost. And so I found myself and I was walking back and it was dark and I wanted to get back before dark and, you know, whatever. Um, and so, again, being a white male, I wasn't fearful about that at all. It didn't make me, un I didn't 
feel uncomfortable. And, and when I talk to some other friends about it and family, they're like, I would have been so scared. Why? <laughs> um, well, okay. So that's, you know, maybe some of my, my um, white privilege that I have. Um, but I started walking um, and there was, there was two, there were two women in front of me. Um, they happened to be, they happened to be black. Um, I didn't think anything of it. I was looking at my map on my phone um, and one of them jumped and turned around. Um, she jumped and turned around, stuck her hand out and she told me to stop. Um, you are getting too close. And I was about 10 feet away from her, um, if I had to guess. And I was like, whoa. <laughs> and immediately I thought, oh my goodness, me being a white man in downtown, I am making somebody uncomfortable. Um, maybe because she's Black, maybe because she's a woman, maybe because of both. Um, but that was one of the first times I I felt truly, truly, truly aware that my impact, that I have an impact on others, that I can have an impact on others. Um, and to this day, when I um, have a student advising meeting, right, and, and most of the students I see are women, um, and they come into my office, I usually always give them the opportunity, do you want to leave the door open? Do you want to shut the door? I'll leave that up to you. Um, whether they want to talk about something privately, they don't want people to overhear, or they don't want to be locked in a room with another man, um, or with a man. And I, I, am now aware of that and and that just makes my heart hurt but again i think having that awareness has impacted um perhaps how i behave in some some ways understanding and confronting racism and and a power imbalance and maybe insensitivity okay um i don't know if i have to even speak more to this um with what's going on in today's society um about you know power um, imbalance is there one with law enforcement and with with um other with white law enforcement and races or law enforcement and everybody um for that matter um i've certainly seen some very insensitive comments um posted on facebook and and social media um about what has been occurring um and that things aren't actually as bad as what they are. And, and so to me, that leads to more of that cultural blindness, right? They're not seeing this difference. They're not, and if they're not seeing the difference and they're being insensitive and they don't recognize that there could be or that there is a power imbalance, then they can't confront racism, okay? And so think about if I were to treat that, that Black woman um, in, in an OT session, right? And she had to come to me, a white man. Do you think she would truly be open and honest with me about her, her background, her need? Would she be feeling comfortable? Would she be feeling uncomfortable? Okay. And, and so is there anything I can do as a white man to help her feel more comfortable? Um, and that, again, is more of that cultural competence, right? Moving towards that cultural competence. And so trying to break habits out of obliviousness and making habits of self-reflection. So constantly reflecting, am I making my client uncomfortable? Um, maybe by the way I'm sitting, maybe by the way I'm talking, uh, maybe by the way, um, maybe by what I'm wearing, I don't know. Um, and so just constantly self-reflecting on that. Um, and then reflecting on your relationship with your client and what you've learned about their culture, okay, or about culture in general. Okay, make sure you're pausing and make sure you're taking a break here. Um, I'm going to keep going, hoping that you can just pause. And again, I'm trying to cut this down um, to stick within your class time. So, um, so being self-aware um, and critically reflecting on ourselves as a person, right? This is where you're exploring your personal culture, what your personal values, beliefs are, your societal rules you follow, how you learned these, why are they so important to you? Why do you subscribe to those? Where does all that come from, right? Um, and then you have that self-awareness. And then you can take yourself through different scenarios, different situations, and there's some other ones in, in the readings that I, that I recommended that you read. Um, such as to help you identify maybe biases. Okay, so um, 
is there a population that brings you discomfort? Um, and then can you pinpoint where does this come from? Okay, um, I took a, a class, an education class that had to deal with um, helping students learn um, and how do teachers maybe with cultural bias work with individuals of different cultures. And of course, a room full of people who were aspiring to be educators that came from many different backgrounds we don't have bias, we don't care. Um, we think, you know, cultural diversity is beautiful. Um, then our, our instructor showed us different clips um, of movies in Hollywood. Um, and, it, and she chose clips that portrayed certain races as, as bad. Um, and, and they were doing a crime, they were doing something bad, um, like awful things. And then she add, had us, you know, respond. Like, how did that make you feel? Were you uncomfortable? Why do you think you were uncomfortable? Okay. Um, and then, you know, she had stories or scenarios that kind of gave the rest of the story where maybe like the stealing thing, right? Um, where you're like, oh, okay, well, maybe, maybe it wasn't as bad. And she's like, why did you, why did you stereotype that person and think the worst of the worst of them? Okay, and so she's really trying to get at us and help us identify that, you know, we do all have biases. Um, and so what is your feeling if a stranger of somebody, maybe a different ethnicity stops you and asks you for money on a busy street? Or what if they stop you and ask you for directions on a country road? Okay, would anything make you uncomfortable? Um, is one make you more uncomfortable than the other? Why is that? How did you learn to be uncomfortable that way? Okay, where did that come from? Okay, what what do you feel when you um, go to a store and you come across somebody that has several noisy children in a cart and they're yelling at their children and those kinds of things? Okay, I know that used to be a huge annoyance of mine. Like, gosh, you know, why are you even bringing your kids out if you can't keep them under control? And now I'm like, okay, I have no choice but to bring them with and sometimes they're just unruly and you know what do you do um and so you know again things can change over time based on experience um color of skin are you able to say that your skin color matches most of the people in your society and can you identify any benefits and conveniences of this? And if your skin doesn't match people in your society, are there any disadvantages or inconveniences you have of this? Okay, and, and can you sense, can you feel any particular difference in power? Okay, and that's kind of a heavy one here and, and will require certain, um, will require some thinking, I think. Um, cultural effectiveness. Um, needs to learn about other culture, but also, Understanding the biases, our biases that we have on other cultures, and the socio-political biases that are imposed upon other cultures. Okay, so if I understand, so I'm thinking back to that woman who who was black who told me to stop and that I was getting too close, right? If I understand, okay, why what is happening in society in socio-political climate at that time? Um, that would make her uncomfortable with me. And if I can understand that, and if I can speculate that, um, that's going to help me be more culturally effective. Okay, if I understand maybe my own bias, um, if I have bias working with that particular person, with that particular population, with those belief values, right? Um, that can help me be more culturally effective. So in order to be more culturally effective um, and in order to develop cultural competence, we have to make a strategic plan for change. Okay, so we all have our own biases. It's just how, how well um, do we recognize them? And so <clears throat> determine, first of all, in your strategic plan for changing your thoughts and working on your biases, um, you need to determine your level of willingness to change or to, to engage, okay? Engage with others of that particular cultural group. So are you unreflective willingness? So meaning you're told to do it or you feel like you need to do it out of obligation, 
okay. Eh, I have to work with this person out of my job. Okay. You know, that's not necessarily a bad thing. Um, there's just, yeah, that's all I'll say. It, it Sometimes it's it's not necessarily a, a, a bad thing. Um, cautious willingness. Um, maybe um, you have some willingness, you have some interest to learn about the other culture, um, but you're cautious because you're so scared you're going to make a mistake. And um, I... I I can really resonate um, with this one. Um, committal willingness is when you commit to learn, um, you commit to engage with somebody of that other cultural group, um, and you really want to make a difference, and you really want to do well at it and be, be successful with it. Okay, so determine your level of willingness to engage. So once you determine, okay, do I have to engage um, out of an obligation, uh, do I am I willing, but I'm scared um, that I'm going to make a mistake? OK, so if I'm willing, but I'm scared I'm going to make a mistake, I can develop a goal and an action step. OK, if I'm scared that I'm going to make a mistake, I just simply need to learn more about I need to build my cultural knowledge, right? I need to um, learn more about it. Um, <clears throat> Same thing with committal willingness. Okay, we can start with just building that cultural knowledge um, and then we can slowly go up and build from there. Um, so if we can establish a goal and we can come up with particular action steps based on what our willingness is. Um, maybe we want to, again, build cultural awareness or build cultural knowledge. Um, from there, once we build that cultural knowledge, then maybe we want to seek out uh, or maybe we want to engage in self-awareness. OK, what what are my differences? What are our cultural differences? Maybe why am I feeling uncomfortable? Why would I feel uncomfortable working with this other culture um, or cultural group or, or person? Um, from there, you can develop a support system. So is there somebody, a good friend, a good colleague, a worker you could just be very blunt with and not feel judged? and say, I'm feeling very uncomfortable because, you know, X, Y, Z. And can they help you um, talk that out, okay, without being judgy? Um, develop resources to improve knowledge, okay? So, okay, you know what? This made me, un this makes me uncomfortable. And I think I pinpointed why it makes me uncomfortable. Now I know what I can focus on to improve my knowledge. I'm going to build resources to improve my knowledge. Um, seek knowledge through intercultural experiences. So here's where you may actually seek out um, a particular experience where you're working with or dealing with somebody of that other culture. And then you reflect on your interactions. Okay, how did I do? Could I do better? Um, Reevaluate your goals. Okay, did you meet your goals? And are you making progress on your goals? Do you need to um, add more challenging goals? So here is an example um, in your readings of a personal plan um, for change um, when working with others from other cultures. And so we have the goal on the left hand side, um, then we have an action step, we have a date to complete it by, and then how are you going to measure if it's if it's completed or not. OK, and so again, just a simple goal on the very top, I will learn more about Somali culture. OK, and so their action step, they're going to read two books written about Somali culture. Um, they have a date there. They have a deadline for their first book, a deadline for their second book. OK, um, <clears throat> then they're going to seek out that that cultural knowledge right through attending some type of celebration. OK, then they're going to actually seek out um, a cultural interaction. OK, getting to know a Somali classmate. OK, and then they're writing a goal for how to reflect on their reactions um, with their interactions. OK, and so um, if we if we purposely write a goal and purposely write a plan, um, we are more likely to follow it. OK, and so this is a really good, um, a really good tool um, that we can use. Um, critical reflection. Did I experience any bias or stereotyping? OK, um, so the first, you know, um, 
I didn't I didn't experience this, but something that, you know, did I stereotype that all Native Americans do traditional dance? Um, okay, did I just kind of assume that and then write a generic goal for one of my Native American clients that says, you will do the jingle dance for 10 minute intervals by such and such a date, right? Um, and then they don't even jingle dance, right? Um, was I comfortable during the interaction? Um, was I satisfied with my responses? Um, is there a way I would have responded more effectively? Did I learn anything about myself during the interaction? And what did I learn about the other person during this interaction? And then how would I improve on my actions when I interact next? Okay, so that critical reflection is how did I do and what can I do better? You're always wanting to do better. Okay, you're always wanting to do better. Um, so I know this is a busy slide. Um, <clears throat> this is from the, the reading chapter 14, um, and these are specific um, strategies. They're pretty, they're general, I mean, but they're bullet points. Um, specific is what I meant, um, but they're, they're bullet points on um, strategies to just have or approaches to have when working with somebody from multiple cultures. Um, on how to elicit information from somebody um, who is of a different culture and considerations for providing interventions for somebody who maybe is of a different culture. Okay, and so underneath the title multicultural approaches, just right from the start, expect somebody to be different um, and uh, consider how culture affects and shapes them as a person. Okay, make sure you're completing a thorough assessment, um, being flexible and being willing to adapt your treatments based on what is culturally appropriate for them. Um, knowledge about differences needs to be integrated with your interactions. And so, you know, you need to be able to know where those differences lie um, between you and your client um, so that you don't just impose what you know to be true um onto your client who doesn't know that's to be true um i'm gonna just i think okay i think i'm doing okay with time uh, i'm gonna share an example one of a, a big aha moment that i had and i think um, some of our students had when i took them down to peru was um, we worked with a little girl who she was well she wasn't so little she was 14 um, years old we were trying to parents wanted her to be a little more independent at home. So she was born without her arms below her elbows, um, and she was born without one of her legs, I believe, just above the knee. Um, and so <clears throat> her parents fed her, her parents did dressed her, they did, they bathed her. And because she was getting close to that age, um, you know, the, the parents and the teachers were thinking, you know, I think she's probably going to have to be a little more independent. And so they had us do a home visit with her. Um, and we had learned that, you know, the parents wished she would be able to go to the bathroom herself. Um, they wish she'd be able to do some of her bathing herself um, and those kinds of things. And so I'm like, oh, my goodness, how are we going to help this this person do this without, you know, um, much of her arms um, and without a leg. So we go to her house and her house is, is a one, one bedroom um, concrete floor and then there's just like slats of boards um, up and then a roof and then on top of the roof is a black barrel that catches rain um, for their for their water. Okay. Um, so I'm, I'm looking around, I'm like, OK, well, let's target toileting first. How does she get to the bathroom? Well, they take us out the back door of this house. And since it's on a hill, like literally it's dirt and rock and she has to walk up about um, about eight feet or so to get to like an outhouse. Like it's it's a wood little shanty and there's just a hole cut in. Um, you know, a wood bench, and that's where you go to the bathroom. Um, and so I'm like, oh my goodness. So she was having trouble even getting up 
and walking, hopping with one leg um, up this about eight foot incline. And every time she would hop, she would fall um, because she would, you know, slide down on the rock and, and those kinds of things. And so, um, so UFTA, right? Um, the other thing we looked at was bathing. Um, and so the the shower, it wasn't a shower. Um, there was a platform right next to the outhouse. Um, it was just concrete and there was like a hole in the concrete which drained into the, the ground, right? That just drained into the dirt. And they had like a sheet um, that just, you know, um, blocked the view from the neighbors. And so basically she sat on a bucket um, and the parents had hauled up another bucket and they just kind of washed her down while she was sitting on a bucket. Um, again, everything was open towards the house. The the <laughs> There was no ceiling. It was just bathing all out in the open with one sheet on a rope um, to close it off. Um, and so we had to think about that for a while, right? We had to go back. We had to try and do some research. We didn't have the answers right away. That was very, very challenging. Um, and some of the students wrote um, to students at home for ideas and and um, one student brought down, then the next group um, brought down a, something she had found in a camping store and it was a black bag um, and you fill it with water and you hang it up and then there's like a hose that comes out and then you push a button on the hose and then you have water that you can you can shower with and stuff. And so everybody was every all the students were like, wow, that's ingenious. I can't believe you found that. That's so awesome. That's so cool. Right. And it and it was it was so cool. Like, holy cow, that's creative. I never would have thought of that. Um, we we go to present it to the family and and they like oh you know and they're like how does it work <laughs> what is it um, so they were clueless and then we show them and they they just were like okay and they were trying to be polite and when we left the students were like they didn't seem like they liked it. <laughs> right and and they and they didn't and we thought about that for for a while um and it, it dawned on me okay it dawned on me how we bathe in the united states is typically a shower right like some of us do take baths um some of us take baths just to relax um but in order to get clean we shower right we pour the water on us and it washes the filth down the drain and, and so forth. And so that's, you know, how we, a lot of us, how we bathe here. So we know that to be true. That is our culture to be clean, right? Well, their culture is to be clean too, but their environment is not conducive to showering. They don't have access to running water or a lot of running water. And so how they have chose to get clean is maybe more of a sponge bath um, type of a method, okay, where they get water in a bucket and they just douse themselves down and they use a rag or a towel um, and they get themselves clean that way. And so not recognizing that we had a cultural difference in bathing, we're imposing upon them our way of showering with running water, okay? And so they didn't want to do it that way. They've never done it that way. So why would they want to do it that way now? And so although it was a good idea, I, I feel like and it, it certainly had the best intentions in mind, um, but it's just an ex a, a excellent example that we have a cultural difference in how we bathe and how we assumed that how we bathe is the right way and we want to impose how we bathe as the right way onto somebody else who has a different belief um, about bathing, okay? Not only that, but the, the mother or the father actually hauled up a bucket of water um, every day um, up to this little strip, land strip, not land strip, um, concrete 
platform um, so that they could so that they could bathe and and um, only did that once a day where the little shower bag he would have had to do that multiple times a day and and so um, again just a really good example that our knowledge about differences needs to be integrated with our interactions okay and being aware of discrimination whether it's intentional or non-intentional okay I, I don't think we always mean to discriminate um but sometimes i think um so it can be intentional it can be non-intentional um be aware of your personal biases and how your bias may affect your therapeutic relationship okay so <clears throat> Um, I worked with a PT who really um, had a bias against chiropractors and chiropractic care. Um, he just felt like PT had more evidence. Um, he felt like he could fix back pain a lot better, a lot more effectively um, than what a chiropractor could. Now, why he has that belief, I don't know. Um, but I had a client who brought their child in with rheumatoid arthritis, um, juvenile rheumatoid arthritis. And he asked her, okay, are you seeking any other treatments? And she said, yeah, we're going to the chiropractor right out of it, right after this. And he, why would you go to the chiropractor? What's the chiropractor going to do for you that we're not doing here? Well, the chiropractor is going to do some acupuncture um, to help with her inflammation. Well, I haven't seen any literature or evidence that suggests that's even effective. So are you sure you really want to waste your money with that? Um, and so again, you know, she came to OT next and the mom was like, I am kind of upset right now. I don't know if I want to go back to go back to that therapist. Um, he s sounded really condescending to me. Um, he um, wasn't respectful of our decisions. And um, quite frankly, we have been doing acupuncture. It's been helping a lot. And um, like, we would rather see the chiropractor than see him. Um, and so again, just listening to the client, responding to their needs based on their perspective. And so again, I, I had a conversation with my um, PT colleague and said, you know, she was pretty hurt um, about, you know, your interaction. Um, and, you know, yeah, well, blah, 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 it's not evidence. He called it voodoo. And I'm like, well, you know, but if she feels it's helping, is there anything that is contraindicated with any of your treatments that you're doing if she does if she does acupuncture after your treatments? Well, not that I know of, blah, 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 blah. Well, then, you know, maybe you should give her a call and maybe apologize. Otherwise, she's going to request somebody else <laughs> or not come to her next appointment. Oh, OK. And I, I think he did and, and they did end up coming back. But um, so how we elicit information. So these are questions regarding the current illness or diagnosis. Um, so many cultural groups have different um, beliefs about illness, about their diagnosis. So what's your understanding about your diagnosis or about your illness? OK, and so just hearing them again, open ended questions, right? What results do you hope to get from 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 our treatments? What do you hope to get from our treatments? Is there any other information that would be helpful or help us in creating a treatment plan for you or a workable treatment plan? OK, so you're just getting their their perspective and hopefully with how some of these questions are worded, um, you'd be able to understand a little bit about what our client our clients expectations are and we can help meet those expectations then. Um, maybe questions regarding health beliefs and practices. So what type of cultural healing practices do you and your family use? OK, and so that would be something like um, that would have come up um, and our client with juvenile rheumatoid arthritis, they would have said, well, we subscribe to the Eastern culture of, of um, chiropractic care. Great. How is that working for you? OK, um, something simple. Um, questions regarding cultural beliefs and values. And so you could just simply ask them, how do you describe your family, your family structure? Um, what kind of support system is available to you? So some cultures have a lot of support systems, right? And some have very little support system. Um, describe your religious practices or describe your spirituality or 
or describe some of your values and your beliefs um, that you hold to be true. OK, so then you know, those will give you hopefully some information just simply about the culture. Now in the reading assignment that I that I posted for you, there's a lot more questions. There's a lot more approaches. Um, I'm just highlighting some of the. Um, just some common ones that I resonated with. Um, so during interventions, be aware of privacy. Um, again, going back to being a white male, um, and in OT and acute care, transitional care, it's not uncommon to work on showering and bathing. Um, I had a lot of women clients, right? And some of them um, were like, oh, I'm very uncomfortable, you know, like I don't want to show you any parts or anything like that, right? Um, and so there were some that um, were like, whoosh, I don't care. Um, you know, there's no privacy in a hospital anyway. Um, but, you know, I always try to be aware that me being a man um, and and working on bathing and something as, as private and intimate as that, um, if I just simply took some steps, like if I just simply brought a bath blanket with me and I caped it around them, right? And I held it and I said, okay, now can you get can you get your shirt undressed? I'm gonna do my best to keep you covered. Once we get you in the shower, I'll pull the curtain, we'll take this off, and I'm gonna, you know, just hold on to you and I'm gonna be put, you know, holding on the the shower head. And so if I was just very careful um, about what I said and how I was going to maintain their privacy, um, um, I I didn't get any refusals um, on, you know, I I don't want a man to help me bathe, um, anything like that. So um, so I felt like I that was something that I did um, fairly well. Um, and then there were some women who were like, don't bother. Like that's, that's just more of a headache for you. Who cares? Let's get this over with, right? Um, so familiarize yourself on non-Western practices. So um, kind of going back to the question, um, what types of cultural healing and practices do your family use? Um, well, right around the time when um, the town I lived started getting more um, culturally diverse people, um, we had a young child come to us and they had bruises um, all along their back. And we're like, what the heck is going on? Um, and so I had remembered um, something about um, cupping, um, which is there's like a dome and you heap the dome and then you stick it on their skin and it's supposed to help draw out um, the illness, if you will. And so um, one of our therapists was going to call Child Protective Services and um, and I said, well, I think, you know, feel free to call Child Protective Services, but I think you all should look, should look into, you know, the cultural practice of cupping. Um, we Googled it. She's like, I can't believe they would do that. Oh my gosh, it looks so painful and blah, blah, blah. And she did end up calling Child Protective Services because of the bruising um, and those sorts of things. And um, Child Protective Services said, well, it's, it's, a cultural practice and and you know it's not doing it's not as harmful as it looks um and the family has a right to to do those particular practices so again i think if we would have asked more of a question about um what types of cultural healing practices do you and your family use? And if they would have said, oh, we use cupping. Um, oh, OK, can you tell me a little bit about that? Um, just to inquire about it. Again, show a willingness to learn from them also. OK, um, I think that would have gone a lot better. Um, avoid recommending equipment they can't afford or is culturally unacceptable. Um, again, like a shower when they don't shower, they bathe. Um, avoid being patronizing or condescending. Sometimes we don't mean to, but sometimes we really feel like the way we get dressed, the way we wash our hair, the way we get bathed, the way we cook food is the right way. And if our client's doing it wrong, or we view them as doing it wrong, we can come across as condescending and patr patronizing. <coughs> Um, make sure you're developing verbal and nonverbal communication skills, or at least being aware of your nonverbal communication skills. If your client you're sitting across from is making you uncomfortable and you're like, you know, they're going to pick up that they're making you um, uncomfortable. 
Um, if you are working with an interpreter and you're able to work with an interpreter, um, talk to them ahead of time to maybe discuss what approaches you want to do with the client and get their get their thought on if it's appropriate or not. Um, so, and some of the hospitals, if you're working with a client who's of a different culture, you can pick up the phone, you can punch in a code, and then a, an interpreter will will be on call, um, so that you can you can converse with that client. Um, in Peru, we had interpreters with us, um, and so um, we often would have lunch um, with the interpreters, and so we would sit down during lunch and we would say, "Oh, I really want to work with." Um, you know, Feliciamo on, um, you know, X, Y, Z. Um, is there anything, you know, this is what I'm thinking about doing. Is there anything you think um, that would be appropriate or, or inappropriate based on based on on your culture? OK, and so if you can kind of get to them ahead of time, you can't always, but if you can, um, you can discuss your approaches to the client or how best should I approach this client? Um, and so I've had interpreters in Peru um, who have said, oh, this this kiddo is a, um, he's a goofball. And so, you know, you can use a lot of humor with him. It'll go a long ways. Um, make sure you're involving the client and the family as much as possible. Um, and again, being flexible and adapting your interventions, taking to an, into account all aspects of the client, whether it's their environment, whether it's their personal beliefs, whether it's their um, cultural heritage, whether it's, it's um, you know, Anything you can think of. Again, every client is is so unique. And so again, more more information on these topics are are in your readings that I have posted. Um, and so that is what I have for culture lecture. Um, I'm going to briefly go over um, the assignment and just sort of lay out the expectations for that next. OK. So here is our cultural exploration, reflection and discussion. And so um, please spend some time reading it. Um, basically, what I want you to do in your fieldwork pairs that you worked with on your fieldwork, um, you're going to be assigned a cultural group. OK, and so students are going to just create a handout um, and post a handout about your assigned cultural group, just traditions, beliefs, customs, lifestyle, whatever you can find, OK, um, to a discussion board. OK, so then before our discussion or in class discussion, I want students to go through and I want them to briefly look at um, some of those cultures as well. OK, so that way they have a that way you all have kind of an underlying um, awareness. Um, or basis of some general cultural knowledge. OK, and so that will be posted. OK, then this is more about you guys thinking about, OK, so I was assigned um, African-American culture. Um, and now we're going to pretend that Aiden, the person we saw in fieldwork, is of this particular culture. OK. Um, and then we want to think about, OK, so how if you were African-American, how would that affect our OT evaluation? Um, would we still give the visual perceptual assessment? Would we still give the goal? OK, and maybe we would. Maybe you would. I want you guys to really think about that, though. OK, and if you would give that um, assessment. Is there another component to then your intervention plan that could be more culturally appropriate based on what you found um, when building your cultural knowledge? OK, and so be thinking about that. Um, on the day of the discussion, um, I'm likely going to just address these next questions because we've already had a lot of these discussions already. Um, the fact that Aiden didn't have anything cultural um, 
in the case. He was white. We can assume he was maybe middle class, right? Um, and so I don't want to focus so much on this section um, because I, many of you have already addressed these sections. Um, but um, what I want you to do during our discussion is is just briefly review us on your cultural group that you posted. Um, talk about how adding this cultural detail to Aiden um, may have impacted your evaluation and intervention. And then as a class, let's try and problem solve ways um, like, OK, here's what we learned about this particular culture. This is what we think could impact or be impacted by um, him being part of this culture and it's going to affect our evaluation this way or this part of the evaluation this part of the goal may not have been appropriate or um so how could we change that is there another tool um is there a way we could adapt that okay and so as a group we're going to talk about that um and then we'll talk about Okay, so for Aiden, we chose this for our intervention. Um, however, knowing this about this particular culture, um, what would be another more culturally appropriate way um, or another culturally appropriate intervention? Okay, and so that's kind of what I want us to problem solve together. Now, once we problem solve all those, I'm likely going to ask you guys um, as a group to share what you learned about culture okay how do you how do you plan um, to continue developing your cultural effectiveness in your future ot practice okay so how do you plan what resources do you use um, what did you find helpful um, what do you plan on doing so you never lose sight of learning about culture because we all know how ongoing and lifelong it is Okay, and so I'm going to I'll pose that question to you all and hear what you guys have to say. Um, so the only thing that I'm asking you to submit you guys is a one page. Um, a one page handout on your discussion board. It doesn't have to be one page, I guess, but just a, pay, a, a reference page, um, a handout for your peers to have access to. That way you all have a start. You all have um, pages of different cultural groups. So it'd be a nice way to just get that cultural knowledge. Um, here are some cultural groups we came up with. Um, depending on your group, um, your fieldwork group, um, there may be another one depending if there's more people in the group or there may be less depending if you have less people in your group. OK, so this may may be a little different, but um, so those are the ex expectations I have for the assignment. And um, certainly if you have other fieldwork um, educators, um, they may have some other um, pointers and, and those sorts of things. But um, that was my creation. So um, that's all I have for you guys. I hope you have a good rest of the day. Thank you.